Um, on Tuesday, we were in the north, and remember that northern art in the Renaissance is basically a blend of what we saw in late Gothic, right, proto-Renaissance, and then the influence of what's taking place in the south. So when I talk about the south, I'm talking about Italy. Okay, so probably the best known Northern Renaissance painter and printmaker is Albrecht Durer. So here's a nice self portrait of Albrecht Durer. Um, he was one of the few Northern artists who had fame in his own lifetime. Uh, Southern artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, Bermonte, they were celebrated in their own lifetime. They were considered to be Renaissance men. However, in the North, artists were normally still seen as kind of like craftspeople. And so they didn't always get the recognition that, that you would expect um, for some of the great artwork that they created. So Albert Durer went on a pilgrimage of style. And so he went to the South, he went to Italy and learned and met some of the great artists. He also was influenced by this guy over here. So this is by an artist named Schongauer that I used to have students study. Um, but he was a really great printmaker. And in the, this Germanic region, so Dürer is from what we now consider to be Germany, um, they were really known for their printmaking, right? You guys know that, at least in the West, the region that printmaking developed, right? The press was kind of invented in this area. So a lot of artists use this as ways to supplement their income because you can sell a lot of prints and earn money rather than selling one painting to one person. So it was a way to like share their fame, share their knowledge, as well as to make you know a, a life. So here's another portrait of Albert Durer, probably the more famous example of him. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this. But notice how confident he is, right? He's staring at us straight in the eye, right? And he's making direct eye contact with us. So that shows that humanist characteristics of the South influencing the work of the North. But it still has a lot of intricate detail. Remember the, um, consider the nut, all that little detail because of oil paint, okay? So Durer was really known for his prints. And so Smart History has a whole series on it, but I just wanna show you some examples of them. This is an example of what we call woodcut. This is done in the same way that Hokosai, right, made his woodcut that we looked at, but this one is just black and white. So there was no color added to it. So he was carving wood to get this image that you have on the left. Um, he was heavily influenced by Schongauer that I showed earlier. But you can see that he uses what we call hatching. Notice how, ha how his value is just linear. They have contours that kind of follow the shape. It's hard to carve wood cut and make it look 3D. And I just wanted kind of a comparison for you guys. The one on the right is the typical medieval wood cut, right? And you can imagine how impressed people were by Durer when you see the image on the left, right? So the image that we have in the 250 is an engraving, okay? And so wood cuts, right, like we've talked about before, you use a piece of wood and then use a sharp tool to cut away imagery. So the stuff in black is the raised surface, okay? Etching or engraving is kind of the opposite. So what you do is you have a metal plate, right? You have a piece of metal, and then you either cut away the metal or you etch it away with, with um, acid. And so the process for this, which I might show you later, um, is basically you take and you, you carve away your image, right? Then you wipe the whole thing in ink, and then you wipe away all the stuff on the raised surface. So all the stuff that's up high gets cleaned off and the ink gets stored in the grooves. So if you cut it away with a stylus 
where you etch it away with acid, it has like a, a bed for the ink to lie in. And then what you do is you use pressure through an ink press and you press the paper and the ink together. Normally the paper is damp and so it attaches really well with a lot of heavy pressure to print the ink. So the cool thing is, is you can see how much detail you're able to achieve in an engraving versus a woodcut, right? Woodcut is very stylized and simplified, but you can do a lot of super realism using etching or engraving, right? So that leads us to Adam and Eve by Albert Durr. Okay, so we're gonna go to go formative in just a second. But what I wanna do is just take a few moments to look at the entire image. Um, we really need to work on that kind of visual analysis, right? And so I want you to look at all levels of space. Who is in the front, right? Who is in the front? What's behind them? And then what's the setting? Like what's in the far distant area? So we're gonna talk about this before we go to the go formative, okay? So what is in the front? What's in the very front or foreground? Who can jump in and help me out? Brianna. What's in the foreground? I'm not sure Brianna's there. Raphael, can you help? Uh, the images of Adam and Eve. Right, so in the foreground, we have Adam and Eve. And if we look at them really carefully, right, we're gonna see Northern and Southern characteristics. So we'll talk about that in a second. What's directly behind Adam and Eve? What's directly behind Adam and Eve? Emily, what do you think? Can you say it just a little bit louder so they can hear you at home? Trees or like a forest? Right, so there's a forest. So in the story of Adam and Eve, this must be Eden, right? So this has to be even. And it's a dense forest. And he's living in Germany, and we know about like the Black Forest in Germany. And so he's showing the world in which people in that area would relate to, right? And then what's really far in the distance? What's way back here? Anyone have any idea what we see on the upper right? What's back there? Cora, can you help me out? Can you see what's in the top? right corner just guess because it's kind of straight it looks like a cliff it looks like a cliff it's kind of like one of those distant landscapes that we saw in the background of like leonardo and frau filippo lippi so we can see the influence of the south in that distant landscape so what i'm going to do is i'm going to stick the go formative right in the chat for you guys and what I'm going to have you guys do is there's two separate essay questions there. But you don't have to write essays. You can just list. I just want to give you space to do it. And what I'd like you guys to do is to describe what the northern characteristics are and what the southern characteristics are. So when we talk about the north, I want you to think about consider the nut, right? The theme of consider the nut, right? Small, detail full of symbolism, right? When we talk about Southern characteristics, I want you to think about PMA, positive mental attitude, perspective, modeling, anatomy, okay? So go ahead and take a few moments on that. You're gonna have to remind me to unpause this. Thank you. 
your slide. I'm not sure if we get each question at the same time or not. I'm going to give you like another minute or so here. You can just put down bullet points is fine. Okay, you guys about ready? Thumbs up if you're ready. Thumbs up if you're ready. How many people are still typing? Okay, I got about four thumbs up, so I'll give you another few seconds here. Okay, what are our northern characteristics? What are our northern characteristics? What are some of the things that you typed in? The serpent in the background is a symbol for evil or temptation. Right, so there are symbols in this. And so if you look very carefully, there's a bunch of different symbols. We have a bunch of different animals, right? And then of course we have in the serpent too. The serpent kind of goes hand in hand with the story of Adam and Eve as well, but it definitely is a symbol. Is there anything else um, that's Northern about this? Besides symbols? A focus on like uh, religion and like God in the natural world. Right. So there is definitely religious subject matter. Um, that would probably be a characteristic of both of them, right? Because that was common subject matter of the day. Um, what did you say about the natural world? Having the religion interact with the natural world? I don't know if that's... Well, they definitely observe the natural world. And that is something um, I would say, once again, is pretty common of both um, regions. Um, of course, that comes from Italy, right? That proto-Renaissance was Rato of like observing the natural world. But that is definitely something that the North had to do too, to get all that interesting detail. So that would be a characteristic of the North as well, right? Is that there is a lot of minute detail, lots of very realistic detail, okay? So make sure for your Northern characteristics, you have that element of detail. Oh, sorry. Right? So there are a lot of symbols. Durer was a Renaissance man. And so he was really interested in the humors, right? And so the in the North and in the South too, um, medical personnel, doctors, thought that if you had a balance of your fluids of your body, you would remain healthy. And so a lot of these animals that we see, right, the cat, the bunny, the ox, the goat, the parrot, 
a lot of these are symbols of um, the different components of fluids that you have in your body. So the elk represents melancholy, which is your black bile in your body. The ox is phlegmatic, which is your phlegm. The rabbit represents your blood. And the cat is chloretic, which is your yellow bile. And so you would want to have a balance of these four humors in order to be a healthy individual, right? The parrot, supposedly when the sound of a parrot sounds like Hail Mary, and so they use that as a symbol of praise to Mary. And then we have the serpent that Jasmine mentioned, and that we also have in the very center a tree, right, that is like lighter and brighter than all the other trees. And so the very center tree is the tree of life, right? So there are symbols embedded into his image, right? So what's the southern characteristics? If the north is detail and symbols, what are the southern characteristics? What did you put? Aaron, can you give me one? Uh, I put that the uh, grayscale and the past sketching. So there is modeling. Very good. So the grayscale from light to dark definitely represents the modeling. Great. What else? Who else can help? How about Isabel Ioka? Um, I sort of thought that the details were from the southern, so I don't really know. Um, okay, so let's break it down. PMA, right? We ha have either humanism or we have perspective, modeling, and anatomy. We already talked about the M for modeling. So do we have perspective or anatomy here? What do you think? Yeah, Nicole? I also was thinking um, like their faces are sort of stoic. So like the positive mental attitude. Yeah. And so, right, Oop, I moved that too fast. They have cool, calm, collected faces. That is a classical tendency. Remember that the Renaissance is a revival of ancient Rome and ancient Greece. It's the revival of the ancients. And so they use the cool, calm, collected face. And then they emulated classical nude for Adam, classical nude for Eve, right? And so we have, you know, reference to Dorpheus. Notice the contrapposto. Notice the ideal proportions. Notice the, the nude, right, with some sense of modesty as well. Look at those legs for Eve and the um, Aphrodite of Kenosis, or no, excuse me, right? Very similar, right? So you can see that he considered himself, like Durr was very educated, very trained. And so he wanted to be as, as good as Michelangelo. He wanted to be greater than Leonardo. And so he too emulated ancient technique. You guys see it? Here's one of my favorites. Um, I think the Art Institute of Chicago has a copy of this. This is the Knight and the Devils. You guys see the devils? They're such great, fantastical creatures. Kind of emulated after some of the equestrian monuments. Right? This is the one that's in the book. It's got full of symbols too. It's called Melancholia. He did um, a lot of illustrations as well. So here he's illustrating linear perspective. Um, Durr is one of the first artists to use what we call multiple vanishing points. So in the early Renaissance, they either would do one point or two point, and they always kind of typically did it for interiors and exteriors. But let's say in your room, your chair is crooked, right? You pull out the chair and it's a jar. And it's not perpendicular to the table and the walls. It's going to have different vanishing points. So he understood that the room would follow its own vanishing point, 
And then any other detail like that chair would have its own separate vanishing point. And so he used that to make it look more 3D. Right? Any questions on Dura? You guys good? Okay. So the next artist that we have is Dur, or excuse me, is Bruegel. And Bruegel, um, his artwork, he kind of has two different styles. This is one of them. Does it remind you of any other Northern artists that we looked at really briefly? Does it remind you of anyone? He's not in the 250, so I don't really expect you to memorize the name. It looks an awful lot like, this is the triumph of death. This is awful lot like Hieronymus Bosch, right? Kind of this pessimistic view, kind of like end of the world kind of imagery and very fantastical. Um, Bruegel, right, has a lot of these kind of scary imagery as well. This one that's enlarged is Bruegel. The one that's small is Hieronymus Bosch. So you can see, right, these both these two northern artists um, look very similar. Right? Uh, Ms. Matas, the screen sharing has been updated. Thank you so much. Let me unpause that. Oh, you guys wrote that in the chat and I wasn't even paying attention. I apologize. Okay. You guys good now? Yeah. Okay, so here you go. So here in Bergal, see how it looks a lot like Bosch, right? Kind of this over the top, totally a lot of figures, kind of sense of chaos, kind of like a pessimistic view of man, right? Man is sinful, right? Needs salvation. So his other style are these images that are super religious, like very highly religious. And so he has common symbols here where these are like um, the kings coming to Mary and the baby Jesus, right? And so here we have another example of it, right? And then these kind of minute detail images. And so even embedded in this one, there's tons of symbols and tons of little details. Um, I actually turned off the slides to save time, but I'm gonna undo it here so that you guys can see it. It's kind of like, remember in the north, oops, sorry, it didn't work. Unskip, right? So embedded in all this is like these minute details and you really have to like look through the layers to see it all. This is like almost like a Where's Waldo. You could probably like look at this for days and find something new every single time that you look at it, right? And so there's these little minute details, like little stories in all the different sections. So here's a cart with thieves. Here's a windmill. Um, Bruegel worked for a printing press that was called the Two Windmill. And so we have a windmill here kind of as a nod to that. You can see the atmospheric perspective in the detail, right? Here we have uh, where the crosses are. This is where be Jesus is crucified. Notice that it takes place in a contemporary setting rather than in the days of Jesus, right? So just these little details all over the place, right? His work, like Durer, was spread through printmaking. And so he was a fairly well-known printmaker. And so he um, you know, earned his money through commissions of paintings, but also the selling of prints, right? Because like I explained before, you know, you sell one painting, you work on it for a long time. You sell a print that doesn't take as long and you can print hundreds of copies and sell one print by itself, or you can sell a whole book of prints, right? So in Bruegel's work, he does a lot of morality lessons. Can anyone tell what story this is? Kind of like a morality scene. You guys tell? This is the blind leading the blind. Can you see that? Right? This is probably one of his best known pieces. And so it's not in the 250, but I just want to show you that he definitely was influenced by what was taking place in the South, right? He understood compositional arrangement. Notice how it's asymmetrical, right? Notice the repetition of color. He repeats the red over and over again. 
so that your eye balances back and forth throughout the composition. He repeats the blues over and over again, right? And he uses perspective to create space, right? So that leads us to Hunters in the Snow. This is the piece that's in the 250 by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Um, there is a Peter Bruegel the Younger, right? That's why we have the Elder added. Usually Elder is for father or uncle, okay? And Younger is often for son or nephew, okay? Because we'll see some other Elders and Youngers too, right? So we're gonna watch the video on this painting. We're gonna focus on the function, right? Function, what's it used for? How does man relate to the natural world, right? And then we'll focus on composition. Trying to get things to move faster here. By deleting things and still going slow. We'll see. Looking at this painting makes me feel cold. We're looking at for today. Bibles, the Return of the Hunters or Hunters in the Snow. It's this wonderful panel painting from the Renaissance, from Flanders, made for a merchant in Antwerp that had asked Bruegel to make six panel paintings, which were study of the labors of the monks. This is an idea that goes back to manuscript elimination, back to the medieval period. And this is perhaps the very first time in the history of painting where that idea has been brought to this larger scale. Each one of these paintings represents a different time of year. We're obviously looking at winter here. And we see some hunters returning from their hunt with their dogs. But they haven't got very much to show for their day out hunting. If you look closely, you can see a rabbit just hanging off the back of one of the hunters. But it is a pretty meager catch. And it does give us a sense of the stresses of winter. You see the footprints that they're leaving in the snow. So there's a sense of trudging through this deep, snowy landscape. And in the foreground, there is that sense of melancholy as well. They're back to the forest. They have the dogs that follow. Their heads are down. There's a sense of them being tired and unsuccessful. But as our eye moves down the and it moves down pretty fast, there's almost no middle ground. All of a sudden, we're down to this icy plum. Then it's a different side of nature. This is painful in some fact. This painting is full of the activities of nature. So we're not just looking at a lovely landscape, but a landscape that is given meaning by the activities of the people that inhabit it, by their daily routine. In fact, that idea is an ancient one that comes from Virgil. People's future may well have been thinking about the future when he commissioned this series. This notion of painting the landscape that is given to me by the labors of the people within it. Although the image seems as if it represents a moment in time, in fact, the paintings were carefully composed. Our eye follows the hunters down the hill, which is given a wonderful visual rhythm by those trees. And then my eye must ride down to that frozen pond where we see a woman pulling somebody else on a little sleigh. Yeah. And I don't want to go by those black cones and under those arches. There's that lovely woman just above who's carrying perhaps some firewood. And maybe on that, we see lots of bright different lights. We do. We see people pulling each other on the ice, children playing and chasing each other. A man about to put a ball with a stick on the ice, playing kind of ice hockey from the 16th century. And then perhaps actually somebody who's fallen, whose hat has fallen off. And this is really typical of Netherlandish painting. And this idea of giving us a lot of visual information, a lot of things to look at, small little narratives so that we can patiently discover more and more. Think about the time that this is made. This is the Renaissance. And in any way, this is an attempt at this moment to perfect, to isolate the most ideal moments. And it's so different from what we're thinking, which is concerned with these almost literary narratives. And the every day, the mundane, but it's so interesting in finding meaning that comes from the multiplicity of human activities. Think about how prosaic 
artwork also can soar through the painting. And Much like the bird. Well, that that's seen. exactly what I was thinking. You have the birds who soar through the space, even into the very distant hills that are a reminder that Google had actually made his way from Northern Europe across the Alps to Italy. But unlike some of the other Northerners who made that trip, he doesn't come back with the latest traditions of the Italian Renaissance painters. Instead, he seems to be caught in the landscape. Look at that beautiful Alpine vista that we have in the upper right. There's nothing like that in the Netherlands. Yeah. There's nothing like that in Flanders. Right, when Bruegel made his trip down to Italy, he said most of his practices were the Alps. And so this is a good reminder that what we're looking at is not an actual view, for example, that Bruegel saw out the window, but a composed, partially imagined, composite landscape activated by these human figures. The landscape feels frozen and harsh, but it's warmed by its human inhabitants. Okay, so what's the function of this painting? What what was it for? Well, one of the functions is that it showed like the hardship between winter and like how they were also able to enjoy like the playing and the work they had to do. Right. So we have it the theme of winter. And so remember that this was made for a merchant. So just like the Marode altarpiece, remember the Marode altarpiece was made for a private home. Um, a lot of pieces in the north because of Protestantism these artists had to create other sort of subject matter. So Bruegel went back to some of the stuff that had existed in the late Gothic. Um, and he created a depiction of the labors of the months. So there would be scenes from winter, spring, summer, and fall, right? And so this happens to be our winter painting based on, the, uh, on Virgil, right? So the nice thing about, like you just said, uh, Varun, is that it depicts the work of winter as well as the play. And hopefully you guys have, or get a chance this weekend to play a little bit in the snow. Okay, so we, you, Varun kind of mentioned this, but let's think about how man relates to that natural world, right? So we talked about the work, right? The, the, the name of this is called Hunters in the Snow, right? So we have our hunters in the foreground, but in the video, they mentioned something really important at the beginning. Um, how well did the hunters do in their hunt? Were they successful or did they have a hard time about it? What do you think? Based on the visual evidence. Jeffrey, what do you think? Uh, they did pretty poorly. You don't see a big deer carcass. You don't see a bunch of fowl, right, birds, like hanging off of their belts or hanging off their shoulders. And so in the winter, it's really hard to eat. You have to scavenge for food. And where they are up north, it's cold for a long time. Winter is not, a, you know, not necessarily always easy in the north, right? However, you better make the best of a bad situation. And so if you know anyone who lives in Canada or let's say Wisconsin, Minnesota, a lot of our northern states, I have family that lives up north and you know what? They make the best of a bad situation. They go out and they ice fish and they ski and they cross country ski and they snowmobile. Like they make the best of a crappy situation that it's super, super cold. Hey, Rich. Hey. Can I just shut this off? Yeah. Um, so, how are people making the best of a bad situation? What's that visual evidence in this one? How are they making the best of a bad situation? What do you think? Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry. Isabel. I said, like, they're ice skating and stuff in the back. Right, they're ice skating, they're playing hockey, right? So we can see that they are enjoying that, 
right? So we got the hardship, but we also got the joy, right? So how does this depict the typical imagery of Bruegel and that sense of morality, right? He shows that you have that you have that harsh nature, but you also work hard, right? And so the evidence of that is you see the body postures of the hunters, right? You see people visibly trying to stay warm. See on this right side, or excuse me, on the left side here, people are around the fire, right? Right? We see you know, people enjoying nature down here. Right? And so with the morality, he's basically saying you have to work hard to make it through this harsh environment, but also try to enjoy the joys of life. Right? So that goes with the functionality of it too. Right? And so composition. Now, they mentioned in the video how Rubel was not influenced by the South all that much. Right? Um, especially in how he like, you know, organized the space. But I definitely think compositionally, you could see he knew what was going on in the South. People like Michelangelo, right, was not just using symmetrical composition anymore. So how is this work composed, right? How is the space organized? Where does your eye start? Let's start with that. Where does your eye start? Isabella, where does your eye go first? Um. The hunters in the front. The hunters in the front. Very good. And then from the hunters in the front, I'm going to stick with Isabella. Where does your eye go next? What direction does it go? Does it go up, down, left, right? Um, yeah, it goes like down the hill to the pond. Right. It goes down the hill to the right. And so he, remember they said this is invented. In the Netherlands, they don't have, they have fjords, right? They don't have, they have flat land. They do not have mountains, right? And so he imagined this repetition of trees that leads you down the hill. And then there's a repetition of buildings. And then there's a repetition of the frozen river or lake, right? And then it leads us to the mountains. So our eyes basically do this kind of spiral and then go back into the landscape, right? There is linear perspective in the building, but he also understood that layering of space and how things get smaller and smaller as they go back into the distance. So I do see his influence on space from the South, right? That more realistic proportion of space and that idea that things get smaller as they go back into the distance. So I have that on the slide there too, right? So we have repetition of trees. We even have repetition of the birds kind of flying into the distance as well. So here's some details. They showed a lot of these on the videos. Oh my goodness, we finished early. Go figure, that's awesome. Um, we, I, I didn't even know we'd have time for this, this is great. So one of the things that AP loves to do is to compare pieces from different cultures, right? So let's look at Fawn Kwan's Travelers in the Mountains. You guys remember? I'm sorry, it's really tiny on your screen, right? Right, so thinking about how they're similar, right? And how they're different. Who can tell me a similarity between these two? What's a similarity? Um, man is portrayed very small comparably to nature. Very good. And so man is small, right? And I would even say the nature component is, is obvious too, right? So there's a major emphasis on that natural environment, right? Either real or imaginative. I mean, this is probably pretty imaginative too, right? The Fon Kwan, right? The trees don't necessarily look like that. That's kind of like his emotional interpretation of it. Um, Anything different about them? Anything different? No? 
How about visually, how are they different? What direction are they going? This one is horizontal and this one is more vertical. This one, right, kind of feels like it might be revealed as like a scroll where you start at one end and then see more of it as you reach up, right? One is in color and the other is in black and white. Right? Or I should just say monochrome since there's no white involved. Okay, so let's let me see. Oh, let's do a review. We haven't watched one of these in a long time. Here's Art 1010. Remember the hand? We'll do a little review of the Renaissance this way. Oh, call me Art. This is Explorations in Art History, starring me and the hand. Well, not the rest of me. How embarrassing. People watching from around the world, and I'm stuck waiting on some five giga prima donna. Oh, that's better. It looks like we'll be talking about the Renaissance period. During the medieval period, the torch lit by the Greeks and carried on by the Romans had been rejected. Medieval values instead elevated the spiritual and denounced the flesh. Then, in the mid-14th century, Petrarch, an Italian poet and scholar of Latin, was able to reconcile Christianity and classical and Roman Greek thought in his writings and revive interest in what had been dismissed as the pagan past. This started a period called the Renaissance, or rebirth. The shift of focus from God-centered to more human-centered interests became known as humanism. Of course, there wouldn't have been much of a Renaissance without a Renaissance man or two. A man with expertise in many fields. Take Brunelleschi, who was a goldsmith, architect, engineer, sculptor, and mathematician. As an artist, he discovered the principles of linear perspective, which gives the illusion of three-dimensional space to two-dimensional art. Start with the horizon line at a vanishing point, and then lines that converge to that vanishing point. Now you have a framework for making objects appear farther away. Or closer. Of course, Brugolesky was most famous for his massive dome. No, not that dome. The dome he built for the Florence Cathedral, equal in size to the dome of the Pantheon. Brunelleschi's new method of construction was so different that some Florentines wondered if he was mad. He devised a way to build the dome without scaffolding and without using flying buttresses commonly used in Gothic architecture to support the weight of large structures. Sixteen years later, when the dome was completed, it was recognized as a marvel of the era, and Brunelleschi was heralded as a genius. Donatello also started as a goldsmith. No, 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 no. Donatello was not a crime-fighting turtle. But Donatello did study the old Roman styles of sculpture and ornamentation. His David is famous as the first freestanding bronze sculpture cast during the Renaissance. It depicts David as the beautiful youth of the Bible, just after decapitating the giant Goliath, and uses classical techniques like contrapposto in its design. Donatello also developed a new way of sculpting in shallow relief that applied the rules of linear perspective to create a greater illusion of depth. He would have been hailed as the most accomplished sculptor of the Renaissance, if not for the coming of Michelangelo, who, along with da Vinci and Raphael, kicked the art world into high gear, or the high Renaissance. Perhaps no one exemplifies the ideal of the Renaissance man more than Leonardo da Vinci. No, Renaissance man was not a superhero. Really, read your history. <laughs> Leonardo was a talented painter, sculptor, scientist, architect, and even a military engineer. He painted the most famous portrait in the world, the Mona Lisa. His boundless curiosity was best exemplified by his notebooks, which were filled with inventions, like a tank, 
flying machine, and a parachute. In 1482, Leonardo went to Milan, where he painted his famous mural, The Last Supper, on the wall of a monastery. He chose to portray the emotional moment when Jesus predicts that one of the apostles will betray him, and the betrayer will take bread at the same time he does. The apostles react in varying degrees of surprise and horror, except for Judas, who, distracted by the commotion, reaches for a piece of bread. Leonardo used perspective lines as a compositional device that leads the eye to Jesus' face, the calm center in the chaos. Though the Last Supper had been painted by others, Leonardo's version was the first to depict the apostles as real people acting, or reacting, like real people. Now we come to Michelangelo. Do you think we can do this one straight? Okay. At 24, Michelangelo carved the famous Pieta, which in Italian means pity. The Pieta depicts the body of Jesus on his mother Mary's lap as she mourns his death by crucifixion and combines the Renaissance ideals of classical beauty and naturalism. Shortly after installing the Pieta, Michelangelo overheard someone say that the sculpture was the work of another artist. That night, Michelangelo chiseled the words, Michelangelo for the Rocky Florentine made this, on the sash running across Mary's breast. Later, Michelangelo regretted this act. It was the only statue he ever saw. It. Michelangelo was reluctant to accept the commission to paint the Sistine Chapel, but Pope Julius II insisted. Contrary to popular belief, Michelangelo did not lay on his back to paint, but stood on specially designed scaffolding and had to reach upward, craning his neck awkwardly to paint. Fresco required painting into a newly applied layer of wet plaster, and Michelangelo, also a poet, complained in a letter to a friend, my beard turns up to heaven, my nape falls in. A rich embroidery bedews my face from brush strokes, thick and thin. Four years later, the arduous task was done, and a masterpiece created. <coughs> The paintings of the Sistine Chapel had a profound effect on other artists. One story claims that Raphael slipped into the chapel to examine the paintings when Michelangelo was absent. Mamma mia, what's the matter with me? It's the back to the drawing board. Raphael scraped the fresco he was painting off the wall and repainted it, imitating the more powerful style of Michelangelo. Raphael became a favorite of the Pope and was commissioned to paint other rooms in the Vatican. His greatest masterpiece, The School of Athens, portrays Plato, Aristotle, and other Greek philosophers, mathematicians, and scientists from classical antiquity sharing their ideas and learning from each other. It's a kind of intellectual fantasy gathering since these figures all lived at different times, and it shows that humanism had become accepted in the church. Raphael even included himself standing with the astronomers. Sounds like my kind of party, Plato, Aristotle, Arturo, Huh? Oh, we haven't mentioned the Northern Renaissance. No, no, no. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael did not go north for a skiing trip. Sorry, folks, you'll have to excuse the hand today. It's just that, well, for many, the Renaissance was an intoxicating time. Okay, so what happened in Italy didn't stay in Italy. The ideas of the Renaissance migrated up into the rest of Europe and started what was called the Northern Renaissance. Jan van Eyck pioneered the techniques of painting with oil-based paints on wooden panels. Artists of the North had a fondness for meticulous detail and were more interested in realism than classicism. Albrecht Dürer traveled to Italy and was friends with Raphael and other artists of the Renaissance. He was able to incorporate Italian and Northern ideas into his paintings and prints. He became one of the most influential artists of printmaking and elevated this relatively new art form to new levels of aesthetic quality and popularity. After the death of Leonardo in 1519 and Raphael in 1520, artists rejected the values of the High Renaissance for a more heightened or more mannered approach. Mannerists like Tintoretto created unbalanced compositions that gave a visual tension to the work. Tintoretto's painting of The Last Supper shifts the table from the center to the left side and emphasizes dramatic light and motion to increase the drama of the image. Mannerist artists also intentionally distorted and stylized the human body and spatial relationships, like this painting of the Madonna by Parmigianino. The figures are elongated, and instead of balancing the angels on either side of Mary, 
They are deliberately squeezed into the left side with only a tiny seat to roam on the right. Ow! How does she do it? The Renaissance was a period of great discovery, invention, and creativity. The Renaissance included the discovery of the New World by Columbus, the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg, the beginner of the Protestant Reformation by Martin Luther, and the scientific advances of Copernicus and Galileo, to name a few. The influence of the Renaissance on Western art is ongoing, and even went viral without Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, because of the strength of its ideas and the beauty of its creations. Okay.